Majid, you can hear me, right? Yeah, I think I can. Okay. Yeah, can you hear Okay, it's seven twenty. You we'll wait like another one minute. Okay, yeah. Let me show you the slides.
Okay, we'll start. Right. Okay, uh, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, everyone. So, uh, so we are warmly welcome everyone to our workshop today in API days. So during this session, so we are planning to uh, talk about like uh, some basic uh, enterprise architecture concept. And also we are planning to do a demo on so how to uh, effectively build web APIs for your microservices. Rajit, next slide. Yeah, so before start, let me introduce myself. So I'm Indika Sampat, uh, Senior Technical Leader at WSO2. Also my colleague, uh, Rajit Roshan, is a Technical Leader at WSO2, so joining with me today. Right. Okay, so before we begin, so I mean, so during this session, so we would like to talk about, uh, so how the evolution of the enterprise architecture. So I'm pretty sure that uh, all of you may have aware about uh, the basic concept. So, but uh, there still could be some confusion when it comes to the application of microservices uh, with API and so and its uh, integration technologies. So, we we will like uh, iron out some of this confusion during the initial part. So, then we will do a demo to like demonstrate. So. Uh, based on our topic, so how to build the uh, web APIs for the microservices, right? So, so this is the very popular enterprise architecture, the monolithic applications. So even today, if you look at, uh, so there are many organizations having these sort of applications. So the word, the monolithic itself, in the meaning of uh, a large individual slow to change uh, sort of meaning so so basically this uh, monolithic application uh, you should like develop on top of the various uh, other systems such as database and file storage so and these type of applications are designed to facilitate like numerous business requirement and also so these applications offers like hundred of functionalities. So all these functionalities generally piled into a, a single monolithic runtime. So obviously, so this architecture has you know a inherent limitation, such as when it comes to deployment, troubleshooting, scaling, and upgrading of the application is a nightmare. Right? Okay. So next slide, sir. So then the service oriented architecture. So this is uh, designed to overcome the problems resulting of the monolithic application. So here we introduce a concept of uh, service. So basically in this architecture, so each business functionality uh, is built as a post game service. So, and also like, uh, so these, services like often implemented as web services. And so once you develop these services, so all these services again, like uh, deploying into a, a application server. So again, which is a monolithic runtime. And also uh, when it comes to the consumption of this business functionalities, so often like we need to integrate multiple services and also various other systems, right? So, so basically like uh, in the consumption of these services, so we, we usually like uh, do it as a composite services. So the, these services are like exposed through a, a layer called ESP layer. So again, like uh, then the ESP comes into this picture. And uh, since like uh, ESP used as like centralized bus, that connect to all services and the system. So it, it's playing a major role in this architecture. And uh, the ESP layer is used to uh, do message routing, 
and also transformation, service orchestration, and also capabilities such as to like uh, implement various other enterprise integration patterns. Uh, so because of that, like uh, a significant portion of the business logic, so it's residing in the ESB layer. And uh, so it's again become a, you know, like a monolithic runtime. So which has a similar problem that we saw in the monolithic architecture. Uh, okay, so next slide. Ali. Okay, so then, uh, so on top of this SOA layer, so the modern enterprise is exposing their business functionalities as managed service or the APIs, so which has become a key aspect now, right? So, uh, so basically in this uh, architecture, so basically what we are doing is we are using API management or the API gateway layer on top of the existing uh, SO implementation. And uh, so like web services is not the uh, ideal solution for to cater such requirement. Uh, and so because of the complexities of the web services technology such as uh, so for W security, so we couldn't do that with the SOA layer. So that is the reason. So uh, API management layer introduced on top of this uh, SOA layer. So basically, uh, so this this layer is known as API Fazard, so which uh, exposes a simple API for given business functionalities, and it hides all complexities in the ESB or the web service layer. All right. So next slide, right? Yeah. So this is the modern uh, like uh, architecture that everybody is using. So, so the microservice architecture is uh, like a, a new architecture paradigm. So, which introduced to like overcome the drawbacks in the ESB and the uh, service-oriented architecture. So the monolithic nature of the ESB and the service hosting runtime, so become a main challenge. So when it comes to the agile development and the services, so basically like uh, in the microservice architecture, so developers are encouraged to develop a single application as a suite of uh, small and independent services, so that are running in their own process and develop and deploy independently. So uh, so the microservice architecture also like encourage you know, to have a, a centralized ESP and whatever the services that residing in the ESP layer. So you need to disperse that logic uh, and uh, write your microservices. So 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 this is the like uh, the the latest uh, the enterprise architecture. So now everybody is uh, looking for. So but. Uh, I mean, so there are still some things even in the microservices architecture. So, so we'll talk about uh, them uh, briefly. Rajit, uh, next slide. Right. So, I mean, so moving from uh, SOA layer to microservice layer, meaning that uh, so we couldn't like simply replace whatever the existing, uh, I mean, the ESP layer. So we, we can't like simply replace that. So the most complex challenging, like realizing in the microservice architecture is, is not to build the service. So, but I mean, the communicating between the services is the real challenge here, right? So, Rajit, next slide. Yeah, so I mean, when it comes to the microservice architecture, so we need, we have a questions like, so, where do we implement the functionalities which are offered from the ESP layer? So such as like uh, message routing and service compulsion and service chain. So, and also like protocol and uh, message format transformation. And there are certain other like uh, resiliency patterns such as like uh, uh, so uh, switch break. And uh, so, and also like uh, the various other uh, circuit break and other like various uh, enterprise integration patterns. 
and uh, some of the microservice implementations uh, had the they they use the api gateway as the main component uh, that take care of this uh, service compression and the service orchestration but it is again not a, like a proper way of doing that and also meanwhile there are some esd vendors are trying to like uh, resurrect the esd in the microservice architecture because of uh, its fundamental incompatibilities but i mean the esd is not going to fit into this microservice architecture by any means okay next slide right yeah so here uh, i mean so we so we'll have a closer look into the microservice uh, so the layer architecture here so this uh, this is particularly like uh, uh, it is, uh, I mean, uh, introduced by our senior director, Kasun Nindusiri. So you could like uh, get more idea about this by going to our uh, website and reading this white paper. So I will like uh, do a brief uh, uh, introduction here. So so in this uh, layered microservice architecture, so we could identify like different types of uh, services and we could categorize them uh, based on the like uh, the different operations they are doing so if you look at this diagram carefully you could see like uh, we have uh, co or the atomic services microservices and we have composite uh, or the integration services as well as we have like uh, api services or the edge services and also it is you could see there could be some proprietary and the legacy systems as well as some web APIs and the uh, SaaS application as well. Uh, next slide, right? If you look what means by the core the atomic services is, so these services are basically uh, uh, fine-grained services. So, so these services, may not have any like external dependencies so and also these services are residing in the bottom layer also like uh, these uh, services mostly like compromising the business logic can it may have less or no network communications next slide yeah so if you look at uh, like uh, composite to the so services are offering the capabilities which uh, the ESP or the integration uh, layer offers in the previous architectures. So basically these services are mainly focusing on the resiliency and various enterprise integration pattern and, uh, and some stability patterns. And uh, also these services could like uh, bridge other legacy system or the proprietary system. So if you remember the previous diagram, so so these type of services are we are you connect with uh, some other systems and uh, build a composite services and uh, provide it to the like uh, to the next layer next slide yeah so the api services or the edge services so these are like sort of uh, uh, services that expose a set of that composite services i mean so the the previously the composite services are supposed to like uh, uh, connect to the atomic services or the legacy or the SaaS applications and uh, build some data on that and after that so these uh, composite services which are like not directly exposing to the consumer instead we are using these api services so basically like uh, to I mean, as a managed services, and so this this is sort of like a, a special composite, uh, special type of composite services. So so these services are basically taking care of like uh, routing and routing capabilities, and also versioning, and API security patterns, throttling, and maybe you could like apply monetizations or create uh, API compression as well. Yeah, so next, uh, so we will look at so how the micro uh, uh, 
uh, with the WSO2, so what sort of like uh, facilities we are providing, I mean, what sort of like capabilities we are providing through our uh, product. Uh, so if you look at this diagram, so you could see, so according to previous uh, layered architecture, so we have a different type of uh, product which fit into this diagram. So if we start from the bottom, so you could see the WSO2 micro integrator. So this could be used as a runtime to connect with the atomic services, or if you have any proprietary or legacy system or web service or SaaS system. So you could easily build your microservices with this uh, uh, WSO2 micro integrator. And also we have a, a, a programming language. So we are offering like a programming language called the Ballerina. So it has the same capabilities. So we, it is like specially designed to uh, build your composite uh, microservices. So it has like various, uh, you know, like uh, features, cool features. So you could use rather than so using a basic like a programming language to build your microservices. And also for the API services, so for this layer, so we have the API management uh, product, so which is, uh, so which has the more, I mean, capabilities, so that support like more cloud native deployment. And also like, uh, so you could like easily like build your uh, edge services with this uh, uh, API manager product. And also we have like identity and access management uh, product. So which is again, like you could use to, so manage your security and the authentication. So that sort of related uh, stuff. So, so right. So during, I mean, so that is all about the briefing about. So, uh, I mean, the architectures that we like, uh, like uh, realizing day to day and uh, so in this demo, so we're going to, uh, I mean, do uh, a building a microservices and also like, uh, so how to expose in them through a API management layer. Yeah, Rajit, over to you. Okay, thanks Indigo. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining all over from the globe. Uh, so. First of all, uh, I will quickly go through the sample, like it's a simple scenario where we are going to uh, build up. So we have a database already deployed in my SQL and we have a microservice uh, that queries that database and expose those data as a REST service. And we have a, a API gateway, which uh, expose this particular microservice uh, in a secured manner and uh, the consumers which, who are using the uh, this particular API in their applications. So uh, basically right now we have deployed the database and the microservices uh, services up and running. Let me quickly show you how we can uh, create the API and deploy the API as the starting point. So I'm going to quickly log into the uh, WSO2 API manager publisher portal so WSO2 API manager is a fully fledged API management solution it allows you to create design manage deploy discover uh, uh, your APIs and uh, it allows you to do full li API lifecycle management as well so here you can see I have already created the API so client data uh, v1 API so I have deployed this uh, API manager as well in the Kubernetes cluster. So this is the uh, backend of my microservice, which, is, which I showed earlier. So this is the backend of my microservice and it has a resource called slash account, get HTTP resource. So this is the endpoint uh, that I'm going to expose uh, via the micro gateway. So uh, let me quickly show you the Swagger file as well. So this is the Swagger file generated for this particular API. So you can, if you have a Swagger file, you can start creating from the Swagger file by uploading it. So uh, here I have created the API from the UI. So the Swagger file is automatically generated for me. So uh, you can see that now I have published this API. So once it is published, now I'm going to the developer portal. Here you can see the developer portal. So it is available in the developer portal 
for the application developers to discover these APIs and consume the API. So as an application developer, now I'm going to use this API in my application. So uh, I have created an uh, application called a SIF app and I have already uh, subscribed uh, this application to that client data v1 uh, client data v1 api so uh, i'm going to take a token uh, quickly uh, from and test whether my api uh, works correctly so i'm going to invoke this api uh, from the inbuilt swagger console and try to see the uh, the data i'm getting the correct data from the backend so here we can see the database the microservice has returned with the data so uh, so now we have deployed our api in the uh, api manager gateway but here uh, i'm going to deploy it in the API manager micro gateway since we are building a microservices architecture I'm going to deploy it in the micro gateway so before uh, going back deploying into micro gateway let me quickly uh, go back to slides and explain the API manager component architecture so here uh, we have three planes management plane data plane and the control plane so the, basically the control plane has the key manager so you show that you uh, saw that I have uh, generated keys. So the key manager component is responsible for generating and validating the keys. And also uh, API manager has a traffic manager component, which uh, right, applies rate limiting throttling to your uh, API. So it can apply uh, based on number of requests, based on headers, based on the request payload, response payload, like many criteria it can uh, apply traffic and rate limiting and also we have the management plane so earlier i show you i logged into the api publisher and uh, already show and created api so the api developers or the product managers logged into the api publisher and create apis and publish them once they are published it is available in the developer portal for the application developers to start discover those apis and start building their applications and the data plane is where the actually uh, actual APIs are getting deployed and where the API consumers or the app users start using those uh, APIs. So in the data plane, we have different flavors of gateways, API gateway, the micro gateway, and Istio adapter uh, to connect with Istio. So these uh, different uh, gateways connect with different backend services, like it can be microservice, legacy service, or any services running on cloud or any serverless functions or AWS Lambda or anything. So this is, uh, so I showed you invoking API from the API gateway and, uh, and now I'm going to deploy it in the micro gateway. So uh, before going to that, I'm, I'm going to show you. So this is the web application that is going to use that particular uh, API. So still, I haven't exposed this API in using API micro gateway. You can see that there are no data coming from my web applications. So I'm going to deploy my API in API micro gateway. So uh, earlier I showed you the uh, Swagger definition. So I have copied this Swagger file from the API manager and I have edited it to change the production endpoint to get as a reference. So here I have defined it as a reference and I have uh, given the default value here as using the reference. So this way uh, I'm using this way because later I'm going to override this particular endpoint and redeploy micro gateway again and again without uh, having to create the containers or the Docker, Docker containers. So let me show you how we can add this uh, and how we can deploy this API in uh, API micro gateway. So the command is API CTL at API minus n. I'm going to give the API name as ng service and I'm going to specify the swagger file. And I'm going to give override command. So override means uh, I'm asking to create new Docker images rather than using uh, 
uh, old ones. So what behind this, uh, what happens behind this command, let me like uh, do uh, OOP get pods. So you can see that there is a uh, now in the service Conico. So this is a particular pod that is running at the background. So what happens inside this command is we have a Kubernetes API operator deployed in our Kubernetes cluster. So let me quickly go to the slides and explain what happens. So the API operator flow. So basically I have executed the API CTL command which is connecting the Kubernetes API server. So my I have my Kubernetes uh, API server running on GKE. And once the swagger is received by the Kubernetes API server, it creates a custom resource definition called API. And it passes to the uh, WSO2 API controller. So I have already installed the API controller in my Kubernetes cluster. And what it does is it creates uh, it uh, runs a Kaniko job in the background and build an image uh, for the particular API. So it takes the WSO2 micro gateway base image and put all the resources backends defined in that particular Swagger file into that base image and create a new version of that image and push it to the uh, Google container registry. So it can be any registry I have at the moment, I have configured it to point to Google container registry. After the contain is created, so uh, it will also create the necessary Kubernetes uh, types like pods, deployment services, and HPAs. So once I execute this command, so it background all these tasks are happening. So I have created a micro gateway uh, using i have deployed my micro gateway in kubernetes just using a, a swagger file so let me quickly check so we can see now the conical job is completed and my micro gateway for this running so let me quickly go and check whether my ap uh, my container is successfully pushed into the google container registry uh, yeah we can see that the image is pushed one minute ago so now hopefully when i go and reload my web application since now api is exposed i hope that data comes here from the back end here so now we have exposed my microservice using the api micro gateway in a secured manner so uh, let me quickly go to the slides so uh, now we are done with our basic requirements so what if what if uh, if we get a new requirement let's say now i have a new requirement uh, to integrate uh, my uh, integrate with salesforce so initially the all the client data of my organization is stored in the database now i have a new requirement to integrate with salesforce as well because some of the data may resides in the salesforce so i need to integrate these two services so there might be reasons like uh, some of the organizations might not like to move all their uh, privacy data to the SaaS applications like Salesforce. So they need to keep some of the data in their local databases due to security reasons. So in this scenario, so what in a typical microservices architecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a microservice and I'm going to deploy it. Uh, I'm going to write implement the logic to connect to the salesforce and get the data and uh, expose it as a API, uh, as a rest api and then there can be a composite service to merge the resource of these two and provide it to the api micro gateway so let uh, quickly uh, see uh, so i have written a sample uh, go code so this is just uh, for the demonstration purposes so we can you can see that i am uh, here doing a token to get the token from the salesforce and then i am querying the salesforce to get the all the required data so i have uh, like created this uh, i have built this and pushed this uh, image uh, to the docker hub so i have created uh, kubernetes resources for this and let me quickly show you it's just simply a pod and a service this uses this particular 
uh, image. So I'm going to uh, apply this uh, Kubernetes file and deploy my microservice that connects with the uh, Salesforce uh, application. So let me quickly check uh, whether the pods are running. Okay, so the pods are running. Now I am going to uh, deploy uh, this API uh, in the same uh, micro gateway instance. So I'm going to delete the uh, earlier uh, deployed API. Uh, so uh, the API is deleted. So uh, now I'm going to deploy this new API in the micro gateway prior to that i will quickly create a new api uh, in the api manager so <laughs> so this particular service is you going to use the exactly the same interface as we have in the client data so i am going to create a new version out of this api and i am going to create this new api as v2 and i'm going to make it the default version and I'm going to create it. So here, when we because I have created a new version from the existing one, it still gives me the endpoint as the old endpoint. So I'm going to edit uh, the endpoint section uh, to point to my new uh, Kubernetes service, which is SF Micro uh, point eight two nine zero, and I'm going to save it. And I will publish this API. Uh, to the developer portal so it is published so when i go and check the apis now i should see only the latest version which is the version 2 now i'm going to deploy this api in my micro gate so so earlier i mentioned that uh, i am going to use the same container and uh, i'm going to override the backend input so in this case micro gateway will not build a new container image using the conquer job it will use the existing image and i'm simply overriding my client data endpoint production endpoint to point to sf micro service so it is creating so if i do uh put serial get pods you can see there is no conquer job is running it's now simply restarting my container so now I have uh, deployed and it will take let's wait a few seconds since it comes up. Yeah, so it's up and running. So right now what I have done is I have exposed my Salesforce microservice. So if I go here and if I uh, do reload, I put I should see different set of data. So it should basically come from the Salesforce. So here what you see is now we are getting the data from the Salesforce. So, uh, so basically the problem with this approach is like whenever new requirements comes, you have to implement all the logic. So implementing logic is you can agree with something you have to do, but still implementing the logic means you have to re-implement all their handling, all the network resiliency through code. So the Go code I showed earlier have zero error handling and no network resiliency built into it but when you are doing a production grade uh, development setup you will need to address those in your new microservice and also you have to allocate new resources for the new code running as well so people go for the services me service mesh to uh, implement microservices architecture but still you have to face these problems when you are integrating with new systems so if i go back again so what i have done is I have written this microservice and I have directly exposed my microservice via uh, the API micro gateway and uh, to the consumer. So I haven't done this uh, composite service. So what do you think I'm going to do? Uh, so right now, unfortunately, I don't have such a code to uh, deploy this composite service. But what we have is a different way of achieving the same. What if I say we can do same thing without doing no code 
without doing no code at all. So, so I'm going to hand it hand over to Indika to explain how we are going to achieve the same purpose without doing uh, no code at all. Okay. So over to you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. So I will share my screen. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Right. Hope that you could see my screen, right, Raji? It's still loading. Uh, yeah. Good. We can see. Okay. That. Right. Cool. Okay. So as uh, Rajit explained, so I mean, so when, when there's a new requirement comes to your organization, so in the microservice uh, architecture, so what you usually have to do is you have to like uh, build a new atomic service, which connect to whatever the like uh, backend or you have to write your business logic uh, in the atomic service. And also not only that, so basically you have to like uh, or maybe like you have to write a new composite service so you have to like uh, uh, change the existing composite service to cater this uh, you know like uh, the new requirement so there will be like a uh, lot of changes so when the new requirement comes in so instead of like uh, doing same thing again and again so it's not about like just writing the uh, business logic right so basically you have to uh, think about the other aspects such as uh, network resiliency and also like uh, so other the patterns that we use in the composition so it will be like uh, the code will be like really big and so it would be a bit difficult to maintain as well so so to address these concerns so we have a, a product called the micro integrator so similar to the uh, the api manager so which offer the uh, cloud native capabilities with the micro gateway so uh, this micro integrator runtime offer the same capabilities that you could use and like uh, build your core for the atomic services i mean the microservices or you could build your uh, composite uh, or the integration services very easily so i will i will like uh, just uh, take you through so i mean how to do that so i'm not uh, going to do everything from scratch but uh, you could see so we have a, a, a nice uh, tooling called this integration studio so which is like uh, the runtime i mean the the developer uh, uh, tool that uh, we use to build your integrations right so in here so similar to the uh, the previous uh, diagram so when there's a, so we have already a legacy uh, microservice which connect to a database and retrieve some data and there's a new requirement to connect to the salesforce so again so we have to like uh, build this service from the scratch and after that so what we're going to do is we are going to like expose these two services as a composite service from the micro uh, micro integrator so if i take you through the uh, this uh, project structure so basically this uh, integration studio so when when you when you have a requirement to build your uh, microservice so we have like uh, a simple way to do in that by going with this uh, new integration project so in here once you like select this so there will be uh, a wizard like this which uh, you could select there are certain type of projects so basically we have this uh, config project and also we have a project called the composite uh, exporter project and especially for the uh, cloud native deployment so we have a special type project called kubernetes exporter project which is responsible to like uh, uh, package all of your config into a docker image and through this uh, i mean since this is a maven project so once you build your project so what happens is it will like automatically push your integration into the given specified uh, docker registry so from there and also as a part of this uh, kubernetes export project so we are having the uh, so we have a similar to the api manager so they have the api operator 
and also we have the same uh, concept called the EI operator. So that used to like uh, deploy your integration into the uh, Kubernetes environment. I mean, without writing any of uh, like uh, the other resources such as uh, deployment or services YAML. Right. So here, so I will I will go through the uh, uh, the legacy application first. Then I will demonstrate to you how we have done that. So basically, if you look at this is the conflict project, so which is uh, responsible to connect to a legacy application. So if you go to the uh, config, you could see that we we have built the API. So here, so this is an this is an integration API. This is not like uh, API which is exposed to the API manager. So this is residing behind the API manager layer. So in in this. Uh, uh, basically, in this integration, what we are doing is so basically like uh, we are calling the uh, legacy applications. So and uh, we transforming that data, which is uh, particularly like uh, required by the composition service. And simply we are like uh, exposing, I mean, responding back uh to when we when somebody is invoking this service so we are doing the transformation and responding the response so that is how the flow is happening here and also here you could see so we have this uh, error handling flow so if something went wrong so then i mean while invoking the backend service which is responsible to go and uh, collect some data from the database so this uh, the flows i mean the error sequence will be executing and you could write anything here. So here I'm just simply like uh, logging the error message and respond to the client with a proper error message. So uh, if you look at, uh, so how I like uh, talking to the, uh, basically the database is, so we have uh, uh, another project type called the data services project. So what here we are simply doing is, so we are building uh, data services so basically, so you could easily like connect to any RDBMS or so like any other data store such as like Excel uh, using this uh, data service feature. So here, what we are simply done, uh, did was like, uh, so we could first need to build the data source, so which is responsible to like initiate the connection. So you have to provide your, you know, like uh, credentials, database credentials, and the URL and everything. So once you build that, so this is like automatically generating wizard. So you once you provide your database and the uh, database, so this will automatically like generate certain queries for you. So basically these are like automatically generated for select all account and update account and delete account and also like uh, insert account. And also it will automatically generate to like uh, query with a particular account ID as well. And after that, so in this uh, data service. So basically you could like map these queries to operations, which means like once you invoking from the uh, your integration service, so basically integration API. So you could specify what sort of like operation do I need to invoke at this. So basically this itself like uh, exposing as a REST service. So I have like two uh, resources here defined. So one is to like insert the account uh, detail and uh, another one for get all the account details. So, so what simply in here, what we're doing is, so we have defined this data service as the endpoint. And so from here we are doing a call. And once the call is complete, so that data will be passed into the data mapper. So this data mapper will be like uh, used to transform so whatever the response received from this uh, data source, I mean the data service. And so we are converting that into a, a format which is required by the composite service. So once this the data mapping is completed, so here we responding back to the client. So who involved the service, integration service, right? So similarly, so, so this is the initial, I mean the implementation we has according to our use case. So we are getting a new requirement to integrate with the Salesforce, right? Uh, by the way, so I couldn't like explain so how how we have like exposed these 
uh, I mean, so how we deploy this particular integration into the Kubernetes. So as I explained earlier, so we have a special type uh, project called the Kubernetes exporter project. So this is uh, used like, so at the time of when you're building the, uh, I mean, your project, so you could uh, select this option. So once you select it, so this will generate uh, certain like resources such as uh, Docker file and also so the integration CR YAML, which is a custom resource in the Kubernetes uh, environment. So we have like uh, with our operator, we are supporting this uh, integration kind called a uh, 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 custom kind called the integration. So so here simply what we are doing is so so if you look at the POM XML here, so we could simply like uh, provide the uh, so what is the base image that we use to like uh, package our integration into the Docker image. So here we are using the WSO2 micro integrator one, two, zero. So you could provide any, I mean, the base image you want in this case. I mean, base image, so basically for the runtime. So so since it is running as a, uh, I mean, uh, uh, running inside the micro integrator, so we have to provide it as it is. And uh, so for the target repository, so here I have given my uh, Docker Hub repository. So basically, if you have like any private repository, even you can provide that details and it will ask for some other credentials as well. So then once you provide that, so at the build time, so what happened is, so first we like uh, take these configurations and also this data service and build a, a packaging called a composite application. So in this composite application, we are going to like package whatever the data, the integration and the data service. And uh, so finally, after that, so once the composite application uh, build is complete, then it comes to the Kubernetes exporter project and build your uh, Docker image, including the composite application. So in this way, you could like uh, easily bundle whatever the integration you built and uh, so with the Maven clean install command, it will automatically push your uh, Docker image to the given uh, Docker repository as well. So once this is complete, so you could simply use the kubectl command and uh, invoke this uh, integration CR YAML. So what here, I mean, what, uh, what this does is basically, so it will, so see, we have already installed the custom uh, resource definition in our Kubernetes environment. So that, that details are there in our GitHub repository. And uh, so once you like execute this, so this will simply create uh, a service, I mean the Kubernetes service and the deployment related to this integration. Uh, so for the new requirement of uh, adding Salesforce, so we are going to do the same thing. So here, uh, so I have built a config project. So which communicate with the Salesforce. So if you look at the uh, integration API here, so what I have simply did was like uh, just taking the Salesforce connector. So we have the uh, 100 plus connectors in our connector store. So the Salesforce is one out of that. So with the Salesforce connector, so what we are doing is we are simply querying, uh, we have written a query operator here to get some account details from our Salesforce account. So you could see this. And also like uh, in the, so when you, when you build this uh, uh, Salesforce integration, so you have to provide the Salesforce connection details as well. So in here, so you know, like uh, when you connect into Salesforce, you have to provide some sensitive data such as like client ID, client secret, and token, and also the refreshed access token and the refresh token. So these details, you can't simply like uh, store as a plain text in your project. So to address these concerns, we have like uh, support to some external war system such as HashiCorp. So using the HashiCorp, you can configure your uh, sensitive data in the vault and so you could simply like uh, connect into the HashiCorp uh, vault through our, I mean, uh, integration project. So what we here have, I mean, so this, uh, the connection requires 
uh, basically like access token, refresh token, client secret, client ID. So these details are, we are not like hard coded though, like we have, we are not like storing this as a plain text. Instead, so we have used the HashiCorp. So once, I mean, this sort of expression we could write in here at the runtime. So what we're doing is we are calling the HashiCorp and retrieve this data and execute the operation, right? So here simply, I mean, so when you have like a, a such a requirement to like connect to a, any SaaS application, so without writing like a, thousand line of code, you could simply use uh, this uh, integration flow and you could build your service uh, very easily. So similar to the data uh, legacy uh, service uh, microservice, so we are using the same concept here. So basically we have the composite application which used to like uh, package this, uh, the integration. And also, so since we need to like have a external connector to the connect to the SaaS application, so we are packaging both this uh, ex, uh, connector and the uh, integration into the composite application from here. So we have used the Kubernetes uh, project to export, I mean, the burn this, uh, whatever the integration we built as a Docker image. And here also I have given the uh, base image as the WSO to micro integrator, which is the runtime that uh, allows you to like run your microservices in, I mean, this uh, in the Kubernetes environment. And uh, so also like, uh, so you could provide your uh, target repository, the Docker repository here to like uh, push these uh, images. And uh, once you execute this uh, integration CR YAML, with the kubectl command, what happened here is like it will uh, deploy the uh, Salesforce uh, microservices into the Kubernetes cluster. So this is this is what happening underlying. And uh, so as the composite service, I mean, so it's not only about like just exposing your microservice, I mean, deploying your microservice, but you need to like expose, I mean, to integrate these two services together and uh, create a unified data set, right? So for that purpose, I have written an, another service, microservice, which is uh, using the similar uh, way, like uh, with the integration API. So in this API, what I have done is, so basically, so I, I'm doing a couple of things here. So first I'm invoking the uh, legacy microservice, right? And so I'm transforming uh, that data to a unified format, so which is uh, required by the uh, the web application. So if you look at here, so as you could see, like the previously transformed data, again I'm transforming into another format here. So using the data mapper. Right? So once this is complete, so then I'm invoking. So I, I have stored this data in a temporary place. So after that, I'm invoking the Salesforce uh, microservice. So here, whatever the uh, response that I'm getting, again, I'm doing a Look, transformation. Hello? Hello? Oh, Rajit, you can hear me, right? Yeah, so I mean, uh, so what I was talking about the, uh, so how the transformation doing in the uh, Salesforce uh, to the unified format. So here also we have used the uh, data mapper to like whatever the response we are getting from the Salesforce side. And we like uh, use this data mapper and so we convert it to another format. So basically the data transformation. And once that is completed, so we are again like storing that data in a another like temporary location. So finally, what we're doing using this script mediator. So I have written a small script to like uh, merge these two JSON arrays into a single array and I'm responding back. So this is what happening in the integration layer. I mean, the, the composite uh, microservice layer and uh, so similar to the previous uh, two microservices, here also I'm using the 
the same concept to package uh, this integration into a, a, a special type of uh, package called the composite application. And uh, finally, I'm using the Kubernetes exporter project. And uh, in here, I have used the same uh, the micro integrator environment to run this. Uh, I mean, our in, uh, the microservice uh, and uh, so I have given the target repository to push my image. So executing this uh, integration CR YAML. So what happened is, so it will push, uh, I mean, so it will uh, create the resource and the deployment relevant to the particular environment. And also there's another uh, concept like, so since I have used the, the two endpoints, I mean, the two micro service endpoints here, so one is for the legacy account and other one is for the Salesforce account. So I, I haven't like hard code that value in my integration. I mean, the the logic that I've written to uh, write a composite application. So instead I have externalized them as the environment variable. So the purpose of like uh, having such environment variable is we are not encouraging any developers to like uh, build a different uh, docker image for different environment for an example let's say first you build your microservice for dev environment and uh, you have created a docker image out of that and you want to deploy it into some upper environment like Kivo or like staging environment then you shouldn't go and like you know change your logic there so instead we could like externalize these uh, changing factors as an environment variable and we could like expose them to the outside, right? So that is what you have done here. So basically, so it's a just matter of like, if you want to like uh, use the same Docker image and change in this uh, environment variables and uh, move that Docker image throughout to the production environment. So that is the, the basic idea of like uh, building microservices very easily with uh, integration studio and using the micro integrator. So going back to my uh, presentation, so so you could uh, so this is this is what I've explained in a composite service layer, and if I give you a, a brief uh, about uh, the EI operator, so what it basically does is so any developer so we have the facility to like build your uh, microservice using the enterprise integrator or the Visual Studio code so. If you use the Visual Studio code, so you have to like aware about this uh, DSL called the Synapse. Otherwise, uh, so this Visual Studio code this doesn't support the UI facility. So what here the developer does is so it, he develop and test the uh, service that he want to deploy as a service in a container environment. And so once you execute, uh, so the build command, I mean, the Maven. So since all these projects are based, I mean, on the Maven. So you, when, when you like execute the Maven clean install, so what happened here is like, uh, we package all these uh, integration into the Docker image and we are like push that image into the Docker hub. And also at the same time, since you are generating the resources that require to deploy your microservice into the Kubernetes environment, so what here we could do is like uh, simply execute the kubectl apply minus f command and provide the YAML file. So what happened here is like it will create a pod and deployment and also service. If you have enabled this uh, auto ingress creation property to true, so it will create a ingress as well. So that is how the flow works. So I will hand over to uh, Rajita. Uh, Rajit to like uh, explain about so how this uh, works in the uh, I mean so how how he's going to like expose his service uh, this composite service in the uh, uh, micro micro gateway layer. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Indika. Uh, I just turned off my camera. My connection is giving me trouble. So all right. Yeah, I can. Uh, so as uh, Indika explained, uh, basically uh, you can see my screen, right? So 
we have deployed those integration CR YAML. So quickly check uh, whether we have uh, those uh, services up and running in Kubernetes. Uh, so basically, uh, there are like uh, three services in the explain the legacy account service that queries the database and the Salesforce account service that connects with the Salesforce and the account service, uh, which is basically the uh, composite service that uh, creates uh, composites the results of these two and exposing. Uh, I'm going to uh, now uh, as I done. Composite service uh, via my micro gateway. So I'm going to execute uh, this command. So I am overriding the endpoint and uh, endpoint zero. So here, what I'm just overriding the endpoint. So the image we created, we know that it, it is the same as the image uh, in all the scenarios. So image does not get changed. So we are using the same image and we are simply changing the uh, endpoint details uh, using environment variables. So uh, I'm going, I have uh, secured the command. Let's check as I mentioned earlier. So there is no image is getting created. We are just uh, respawning a new image. So let me quickly check. So our the image is up and running. So if I go to my UI again, so right now uh, I have details only from the Salesforce. So if I now reload this UI, it should I have I, I should have more data, combined data that coming from the database as well as uh, Salesforce. So let's wait and check whether we get more data. Yes, so we get like the combined results. So both of the results are coming uh, since we have exports exposed the composite uh, service. So basically. Uh, so what we have done is like uh, we have uh, created uh, microservices. We have we have shown two different ways, like simply writing, uh, simply writing Go uh, like microservice in any language you prefer, and then uh, deploy them. Or we have shown you how you can achieve the same via the micro integrator and exposing those microservices uh, securely using the micro gateway and the API management platform so uh, if we go to the uh, questions uh, so there's a question from satish like uh, he asking how can i make sure that the new image which is deployed in kubernetes will work as per new version so basically as i mentioned earlier so we are not uh, creating uh, so we are not creating recreating image we, i have used the same image so basically, if we are like publishing the same version, the best practice is to reuse the same image. But if you are creating a new version, uh, so in here I have used the same image to reduce the image build time. So the best practice is to create a different version, uh, different image and test it in your development uh, environment and use reuse the same image in your production environment by overriding your uh, data using environment variables and uh, if he asked whether if i want uh, both versions to exist while the some consumers connect to v1 and v2 so in api manager publisher portal so i have shown you that these two apis are exist one is v1 and one is v2 so one api is, is exposed as clients slash v1 to the uh, public so it is exposed as client slash v1 if i go to the the API it is exposed as clients as slash v2 so both are both APIs are available and since I have made this API the default API so it can be accessed using clients slash clients only if someone access client slash v1 it will go to the v1 API if someone ac access using client slash v2 it will go to the v2 and if someone access slash clients, it will again go to the V2 since it is the default API. Uh, okay, so I think other questions. So Indica, there's a question. Uh,
Yeah, so there's a question. Can composite services uh, created from GUI be exported to the outside of WSO system? Are there source code uh, license? Uh, no, so we create these uh, composite services from the developer studio. So you can uh, like you can export uh, export them and uh, you can use it because the WSO2 products or the products are open source products. So you can export them and use them uh, in uh, anywhere you prefer. So I think uh, Indica has uh, some connection issue, issues. So, so that's all the questions uh, we have. So I hope uh, we've been able to like share something meaningful with you. So, so I'm going to wrap up this session. Uh, thank you very much for joining with us. Uh, thank you, and have a good, good day. Thank you.